Hello everyone, welcome to this episode of the Zoology Podcast for May. This episode is going to be a little bit different. I'm not actually going to go through a bunch of research. Instead, I just want to shine a spotlight on an animal, which I find truly fascinating due to its evolutionary history and some of its really interesting and unique physiology. And that animal is the Tuatara. So, the Tuatara belongs to an order of reptiles called Rhynchocephalia, which originated in the Triassic period. That's around... 250 million years ago, and had spread worldwide by the early Jurassic, say around 200 million years ago, and during this time had produced many different species by the end of the Mesoic era. However, now only the genus Phenodon exists, in which only the single species of Tuatara survive unassisted on the small northern islands and the brother islands off the coast of New Zealand. Now, if you were to see a Tuatara, you could be excused in thinking that you had seen some kind of lizard. However, the Tuatara are not actually lizards, despite looking very similar. They are actually, in fact, their own distinct, unique lineage. I think a good way of thinking about this is that the Tuatara, or more accurately their genus Sphenodon, is a close cousin to the squamates, those being lizards and snakes, due to them sharing a recent common ancestor. This is similar in the way in which crocodiles are turtles or reptiles, but are not themselves lizards. Okay, so now I'm going to do something that's maybe a bit off-kilter for a podcast and actually describe to you what the Tuataras look like. It's going to be a bit weird, but bear with me, maybe we can have some fun. Okay, so the Tuatara are lizard look-alike reptiles, which exist in two populations. The Tuatara of the Brothers Islands tend to have olive to brown skin, in which they can have yellowish patches, while the Tuatara located on the northern islands off the coast of the North Island range in colour from olive green through to greys and to brick reds, and these tend to be scattered with white spots. Now both populations are actually sexually dimorphic, that means the males and females tend to have distinct, different physical features from each other. Within the Tuataras, the males being on average larger than the females, males can actually grow up to around 80 centimetres long, while females only tend to grow to a length of around 45 centimetres. And males, as you may have guessed, actually weigh a lot more. They can weigh up to one kilogram, while females tend to weigh about half this amount. The two sexes of the Tuatara differ in more than just size. They actually have a spiny crest of soft triangular skin folds that run along the spine. This is actually where the Tuatara get their name. It's derived from Maori and means peaks on the back. So these skin folds can actually be a lot larger in males and can be stiffened for sexual displays. These are some of the sexual dimorphism differences between the Tuatara. What other traits do the Tuatara have that I think make them truly fascinating creatures? Let's begin at the head and work our way down to the tail. The tip of the Tuatara's upper jaw is beak-like and separated from the remainder of the jaw by a small notch in the bone, yet it's still firmly attached to the posterior of the skull, giving the Tuatara a strong, rigid but inflexible head, perfect for biting. In the Tuatara's mouth, there is a single row of teeth in the lower jaw and a double row of teeth in the upper jaw, with the bottom row fitting perfectly between the two upper rows when the Tuatara closes its mouth. Now this configuration can result in nasty wounds if you're bitten due to the jaw's joints allowing the lower mandible to slide backward and forward again between the two upper rows of teeth. This movement allows the teeth to shear through the chitin and bones of its prey. However, this force results in wear and tear on the teeth which means an old Tuatara's teeth become extremely worn away, and because they don't have the ability to replace these teeth, they eventually have to quit hunting animals with hard surfaces, and instead hunt soft prey such as earthworms. Okay, now let's move from the jaw up to the ears. The Tuatara, like turtles, have extremely primitive hearing organs. They don't actually have any external ears, or an ear hole, or even an eardrum for that matter. Instead, their middle ear cavity is just filled with fatty adipose tissue. This means that when you compare their hearing organ to, say, that of a human, the Tuatara's ability to hear sounds is really poor. In fact, the Tuatara can only hear from around 100 hertz to 800 hertz, with their peak sensitivity being at 40 decibels at 200 hertz. This is about the sound that a very quiet library would produce. In comparison, a human under 24 years old can hear from around 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz which is a far greater range. After this podcast, why don't you find out what range of hertz you can still hear and tell me in the comments. Okay, now moving up again to the eyes. The Tuatara has excellent colour vision, possessing the three type of photoreceptive cells, which also give humans our ability to see well and in colour. 
On top of this, the tuatara also has a third eyelid called the nicotating membrane. You may have seen this type of eyelid opening and closing on your cat or dog. It's a translucent membrane which protects and moistens the eye while maintaining vision. Actually, humans still technically have this, though it's called the cranula lacrimalis, and in humans it has lost its function. If you want to find it, look in a mirror. It's a small pink lump located in the inner corner of your eye. Now, unlike humans, the tuatara also possess a tapetum lucindum, which is a layer of tissue lying immediately behind the retina. Its role is to reflect visible light back through the retina, which increases the light available to the eye's photoreceptors, thereby contributing to the tuatara's excellent night vision. If you have ever taken a photo of your cat or dog, you may have seen the light reflecting back out of their eye. This is actually reflected by the tapetum lucindum, and it shows up as a bright reflection in any photos you will take of them. But perhaps the most interesting aspect of the tuatara's eyes is that they have a parietal eye. That is a third eye on the top of their head. This eye has its own lens, called the parietal plug, which resembles a cornea. It also has a retina with rod-like structures, and it is connected to the brain through an underdeveloped nerve. Now, unfortunately, we don't actually have a bunch of adult tuataras running around with three eyes. And that's because while this eye is present in the tuatara, it's actually only visible in hatchlings. And after about four to six months, the eye becomes covered over with pigmented scales, which pretty much stops us from being able to see it at all. And how disappointing is that? A true three-eyed lizard would be just mind-blowing. We don't really know why the tuatara is born with this third eye. People have hypothesized that it may be useful in absorbing ultraviolet rays to stimulate vitamin D production, as well as to determine the amount of light during the day-night cycle and to help with thermoregulation. Although the third eye being part of the pineal complex means that eye might also play a role in determining the amount of melatonin secreted by the pineal gland during the night. Okay, so that's the head done. Let's move on down to the body. The tuatara's spine is made up of hourglass-shaped vertebrae. This shape of vertebrae is usually found in fish and some amphibians, but is unique to the tuatara out of all reptiles, birds, and even mammals. Their vertebrae also have tiny holes in which the remnant of a notochord passes through. This configuration was common in early reptiles, but has been lost in all reptiles except the tuatara. Okay, so just under the spine are the gastralia, which are rib-like bones, also known as the abdominal ribs. These ribs are mostly comprised of cartilage and are not actually attached to the spine or the ribcage. The tuatara's true ribs the ribs which attach to the sternum are just small bony projections with small bone hooks at the end of each rib called uncinate processes. This is a feature which the tuatara share with birds. However, the tuatara is the only living tetrapod with well-developed gastralia and uncinate processes. These two features have developed from early tetrapods in which the gastralia and the ribs would be combined with bony protrusions of skin plates and the collarbones to form a protective exoskeleton around the body. However, now obviously the tuatara has lost this cool protective exoskeleton and is just left with the internal gastralia protecting its abdominal organs. Okay, so now moving from the belly all the way down to the tail. The tuatara actually share with some species of lizard the ability to break off its tail when threatened by a predator and then, perhaps most impressively, regenerate that portion of the lost tail. The regrowth can take a long time, and it can result in the tuatara actually growing an imperfect recreation of their original tail. Now moving on from this, I'm not really going to talk about a body part per se, but more what the body does as a whole. So one of the most fascinating things I find about the tuatara is they actually have one of the slowest growth rates of any reptile not becoming full grown until they are around the age of 35 years old. This may assist them in living their incredibly long lives, with the average tuatara living to around 60 years old in the wild, but some have been documented to live to well over 100, and it has even been theorised that in captivity they may live to be over 200 years old, and if that is true, that's just incredible. But even if they can't actually reach 200 years, just living over 100 years still makes them one of the oldest living reptiles on the planet, only being beaten by turtles. So that's some of the tuatara's physiology, which makes them truly fascinating animals. But they don't stop there. These little reptiles really try to outshine their cousins by having some of the most unique behaviour of any reptile. 
So, to start us off, the Tuataras are one of the few reptiles which are actually nocturnal, meaning that they spend most of their active time during the night. However, they get even more interesting than that. Juvenile Tuataras are actually diurnal, that means they're active during the daytime. And this is because the young are forced to be active during the day due to the adult's Tuatara being cannibalistic. So you might be asking, how do the Tuatara get about during the night when reptiles need to sun to warm their bodies to facilitate action? Well, the Tuatara still need to do this, they still need to bask in the sun, but they can kind of get away with doing less of it, and I'll, I'll tell you how. The Tuatara actually have other unique factors which allow them to thrive in low temperature environments, which are actually detrimental to most other reptiles. The Tuatara can be physically active in temperatures as low as 5 degrees Celsius, but this comes with a drawback. Temperatures over 28 degrees Celsius, which are normally well tolerated by many reptiles, are actually fatal to the Tuatara. This is because the optimal environmental temperature for the Tuatara ranges from 16 to 21 Celsius, while the Tuatara's body temperature is the lowest of any reptile, being between 5 and 11 degrees Celsius throughout the day. For comparison, most reptiles' bodies' temperature needs to be around 20 degrees Celsius. Now, despite the Tuatara's physical adaptation to the cold, New Zealand winters can get a little chilly, as temperatures dip close to freezing, and this is below what the Tuataras can physically handle. But they do have a method of dealing with these temperatures, and that is to occupy a burrow dug by a burrowing bird, or to dig their own, and then go into hibernation during the winter. And how amazing is that? Taking a ticket right out of the polar bear's playbook. After this hibernation period is over, the tuatars will become active again, and in the process they begin to hunt the insects which make up most of their diet, or they can even snag a random lizard, bird egg, or a newly hatched chick if the opportunity arises. The energy gained from this hunting can then be put towards defending territory from intruders, a behaviour that actually both males and females perform, or it can be used to try to find a mate to breed with. Although finding a mate can take some time. Tuataras do not become sexually mature until they are around 20 years old, and even then, they only breed in midsummer, once every four years. What's interesting about how Tuataras breed is that the males have actually lost their ancestral penis, and instead have rudimentary hemipenes, two penile-like organs used to deliver sperm to the female. The act of copulation in Tuataras is actually known as a cloacal kiss, due to the reptiles pressing their cloacas together to mate. It's kind of like how humans kiss, but with genitals. After copulation, it takes between 12 and 15 months for an egg to hatch, and when you couple this with the four year period it takes for the female to form an egg, the Tuatara has the slowest generational cycle of any reptile. Although when you take into account the long life these animals can live, a single individual can actually have many breeding opportunities. To illustrate this, I think a famous example is that of a male Tuatara named Henry who actually lived in the Southland Museum and Art Gallery in New Zealand, and became the oldest known Tuatara to breed at the ripe old age of 111 years old. That Henry was a dirty old Tuatara. <laughs> Anywho, once the eggs have been laid in the female's burrow, the sex of the baby Tuataras is actually dependent upon the temperature of the egg, with warmer eggs tending to produce males and cooler eggs tending to produce females. Now this can be actually both a blessing and a burden for conservationists, because say an increase in temperature facilitated by global warming can have the potential to lead the majority of wild tuatara populations becoming male. However in captivity, the sex of captive populations can be neatly controlled due to modern incubation machines allowing breeders with a degree of confidence to achieve the sex ratio they desire. So despite the Tuatara being this awesome unique creature that has this awesome unique lineage and having these really awesome adaptations to the cold for a reptile, it's actually been listed as a vulnerable species by the ICUN due to their current range being restricted to 32 offshore islands with only a population of about 60,000 to 100,000 individuals being left in the wild. Now that's just a massive shame. And unfortunately, some of these islands have actually become colonised by rats, which seem to compete for the same food resources as the Tuatara. And when rats are on the islands, there have been no reports of any juvenile Tuatara. This leads us to believe that when rats are present, they probably predate on the juveniles, therefore putting a big stumbling block in the way to any future Tuatara populations being able to be maintained. 
This motivated conservationists to launch an expedition to eradicate the rats from many of the Tuatara's home islands. Since 1990, 10 islands have actually had their rat populations eradicated, and this has allowed for the successful reintroduction of the Tuatara to their one-time homes. Going even further than that, conservationists have begun introducing Tuataras to islands which previously lacked any populations. This is being conducted as a safekeeping method, in order to give the remaining Tuatara the best chance of survival in an ever-changing world. So let's leave this podcast on a bright note. In 2005, multiple Tuatara were released into the strictly protected wildlife sanctuary called Zealandia. A second mainland release occurred in 2007, in which 130 Tuatara were released into Zealandia. And then, in 2009, the first ever recorded wild-born Tuatara was observed within the Zealandia Wildlife Sanctuary. This is thought to be the first case of Tuatara successfully breeding in the wild on New Zealand's North Island in over 200 years, which is just a great success. And I personally hope that more Tuatara will call the North Island home in the future. Okay, well that's some good news for this month's podcast, and I hope that you find the Tuatara just as amazing and unique as I do.